2,410 years. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. My name is Nicole Clay and if you would like to see how I got this look or you just here for Moses Satole, then let's keep watching. So I've been speaking a lot about other countries' serial killers and unfortunately, as we know or as you may not know, South Africa is no stranger to serial killers or killers in general, unfortunately. So this is more of a homegrown kind of story. I guess it's slightly more relatable because, I mean... We live in these places that I'm talking about now with this guy. So in this story, unfortunately, a lot of terrible things happen to these women. I'm not going to go into depth about what happened. You can read that up in your own time, but I will be saying what happened. But just, yeah, I'm going to keep it PG, guys. So Moses Atole was born in Phosphorus in South Africa on November 17, 1964. And the area that he was born in um, is close to a place called Boxburg. And also, even though I am South African, so I'm sorry I'm offending my own culture with how I pronounce these things. So Moses was one of five children. His mom was named Sophie and his dad was named Simon. So unfortunately, Moses had a pretty rough upbringing. There was a lot of poverty in the area that he lived and, and his family had experienced or experienced a lot of poverty while he was growing up. Unfortunately, when Moses was really young, his father passed away and his mom had to now look after the five children by herself. So quite sadly, his mom couldn't support the children at all. So she took the children and abandoned them at a police station. And then in turn, the police station took them to an orphanage that landed them up in a place called KwaZulu Natal. So unfortunately, while Moses was in the orphanage, he was abused and beaten up quite badly. And he only lasted in the orphanage three years before he ran away. And when he ran away, he eventually landed up with his older brother who like left the orphanage a while ago. And um, eventually he started working in a mine in Johannesburg. Sources say that Moses was quite sexually active at a young age, but the relationships that he had with the women that you know, he was busy with, they didn't last very long. A lot of sources do say that Moses was handsome and charming, and unfortunately this is how he got his victims into the state that they were. It's not clear on a specific date, but when Moses was a teenager, he was sent to prison for seven years for sexual assault. So later on, he would blame his young years that he spent in prison as to why he started murdering the woman because these women that he chose to sexually assault and murder, they all reminded him of this woman who sent him to prison back in his teenage years and he said falsely accused him. So he kept trying to get revenge on the woman that sent him to prison all those years ago. So that being said, it's not officially known when Moses committed his first sexual assault but the first recorded assault was recorded in September 1987 when he attacked a lady named Patricia Comalo. But unfortunately, due to maybe bad police work or lack of evidence, there was nothing done in this case. Then in February 1989, a lady named Buyiswa Dara Swakamisa was sexually assaulted by Moses, where he was arrested and sentenced to six years in prison, which of course he maintained his innocence. Then, in 1993, he was released on good behavior. And you know, when I read these cases and stuff, sometimes it really annoys me when um, inmates, in some cases, are released on good behavior. Because in my head, like, obviously they're going to be released on good behavior because what is triggering them to do the crimes that they do in the outside world, they don't have that there. He doesn't have the woman that reminds him of the first lady that sent him to prison because there are no women there. So obviously he's not going to commit any sexual assault. Was it just me? It also makes me wonder that because he was in prison for such a long time, did that maybe switch a light bulb on in his head to make him now want to kill the woman? Because now if he had no woman left behind, then he wouldn't be accused of anything because there's no proof. So soon after Moses was released, in January, between January and April 1995, in a place called Atteridgeville, which is just west of Pretoria, four bodies of young women were discovered. They had all been strangled, but sexual assault, they couldn't determine if that had happened. I'm not sure if maybe it was because the bodies were too decomposed, or they just didn't test for that maybe at the time. So when these four bodies were found, the media noticed that there were similarities between the four bodies, 
and they then put pressure on the police to to release that there may be a serial killer on hand in south africa so unfortunately a body of a two-year-old child was found near the four victims that were also found so unfortunately during that time there was a lot of political turmoil and also there was a lot of violence happening in south africa so the the media was stuck of what they should be covering so obviously they did cover the story of the women who were murdered, but the, the media didn't stay too focused on that story for long. They moved on quite quickly from the story, unfortunately. On July 17th, 1995, a witness saw Moses acting really suspiciously when he was with a woman. So then the witness decided that he was going to investigate later on why Moses was acting so suspiciously. So he followed Moses. And instead of finding Moses, he unfortunately found a dead body. And this was the woman that he saw Moses with earlier. And then the witness went to police, um, obviously. And now the police were like, okay, we've clearly got to find this guy. Because the woman who he had just killed near the witnesses also died of the same um, strangulation and sexual assault that the other victims had been, uh, had been killed with. So the police decided to set up a task team in order to try and solve these murders. But interestingly, when the police first started with the task team, they thought that um, the murders were not committed by one person because when they were investigating how the women were killed, they noticed that there were slight differences in the from the beginning of the first woman that was found to um, to now when the last one was found. But then as police started to investigate more into the bodies, they actually noticed that it wasn't a different person who was, or wasn't more than one person committing these murders. It was actually just the perpetrator was getting and involving the way that he was killing. So it was the same person, he was just changing the way that he was killing. And what they noticed was that the person who was evolving this killing was becoming more and more violent and improving so that he could inflict more pain on his victims. And unfortunately at the time South Africa had a large unemployment rate. Moses would take advantage of this. He would meet women in the middle of the day and promise them um, employment opportunities and then he would lure them into their fates and kill them. <sighs> Allegedly. And then on September 16th, 1995, a body was discovered in the Van Dijk mines near Boxburg. And then when police got there and furthered their investigation, they found 10 more bodies that were buried around the mine. And all of these bodies were in various degrees of decomposition. And then when the police saw these bodies, they were convinced that these bodies were linked to the Atteridgeville murders. And because more bodies were being discovered, the media presence became intense. And even President Nelson Mandela came to visit where the bodies were discovered. So of course, the police were now under pressure to get these all sold and they were getting nowhere so they enlisted the help of a fbi agent a retired one named robert resler who landed in south africa on the 23rd of september 1995 and he created a profile of the killer that says that the killer was intelligent he was organized and he had a very high sex drive and he was also operating with a growing sense of confidence and he may be using a second killer to help him kill his victims then while investigations were underway at the mine and at the mass grave site, a body of a woman named Amelia Rapodile was last seen according to sources and her family meeting with a man named Moses Satole around the 7th of September and near her body they found a job application which showed that she had been hired for a position. Then another victim that they found also had a connection to this Moses guy. So police knew, okay, they have their man. So police were unable to find Moses and clearly Moses didn't care that there was a massive manhunt out for him because he continued to kill people. So the body of Angus Mabuli was discovered around the 3rd of October 1995. And the same day that her body was discovered, the, a news outlet received a call from a man who said that he was the serial killer because when he called he had information that was not listed to the public yet so the police tried to set up a meeting with this guy who called the news station but that failed so then while they were trying to set up this meeting he murdered another three more people and then police were like nah so now they set up an entire bolo or be on the lookout for this moses guy and they sent all the details to the public so now the public could see and try and apprehend this guy too now because the manhunt was so public and ordinary people could now apprehend him, Moses became concerned and he asked for help from his family 
but police were smart and they were watching him at this time. Um, so police apprehended him on October 18th, 1995, but Moses would not go down without a fight and police ended up shooting him in the leg and the stomach. So he ended up going to hospital because of it. So when he was admitted to a military hospital in Pretoria, Moses then confessed to all of the killings and all of the murders that happened. So starting from the beginning of Moses's crimes, the prosecution introduced really disturbing testimony from um, Moses' earlier sexual assault victims, he detailed their ordeals that they had to suffer at the hands of Moses. In, on December 3rd, 1996, the prosecution introduced a video that was shot during Moses' initial incarceration, in which Moses admitted to 29 murders. He describes his techniques in some detail in the video, although he claims that he only began killing in July 1995, which obviously now is inaccurate to everyone else's account, Moses. But when he initially started killing, he said that in this video, that he would select his victim for the resemblance of the sexual assault victim of Buisa, remember her? Whom he regarded as responsible for why he was in jail in the first place. Remember I said that? I told you. I told you. So now the legality of this confession tape that was in the hands of the defense, taken illegally, which caused the trial now to be delayed to January 29th, 1997. And this caused the trial then to drag on until July 29th, 1997, when the judge finally ruled that the evidence was admissible. And then on December 4th, 1997, Moses was found guilty on all charges, and it took three hours to read the verdict. And because of that, the sentencing had to be done the next day. And then the next morning, a judge made a statement that because of his repulsive crimes, he would have no hesitation to sentence him to death. However, the death penalty in South Africa had been declared unconstitutional already in 1995. So instead of the death penalty, Moses was sentenced to 2,410 years in prison, with no possibility of parole for at least 930 years. Moses is incarcerated in the maximum security section in Pretoria Central Prison which is the highest security cell block in South Africa, known as C-Max. So Moses was diagnosed with HIV and he was given medicine in this prison that far exceeds any treatment that the average South African gets outside of prison, which now secures him an even better and longer life, even though it is in prison. So that was all I have for you on that case today. <sighs> Let me know if you would maybe prefer a series of South African serial killers. We have quite a few. Um, and I'll be glad to do some, so let me know in the comment section below if you would like that. So this was quite an interesting case because I knew about Moses very roughly in the back of my head, but I was only born 94, showing my age here, but I was only born in 94, so this happened right when I was, you know, fresh out of the womb. So it never really sunk in, it wasn't really relevant to me at the time, but I think it is quite interesting to see how police managed, or luckily managed to solve this. Um, yeah, I think the police did a really good job on this case, but other than that, it was, yeah, it was quite hectic. But thank you again for joining me today. I had a lot of fun with you here today. Please stay safe out there wherever you are. Clearly there are some crazies out there. I hope to see you again soon. Come join me for the next one and thank you so much. Bye.